You're lazing around on the deck of the ship when you see something whitish-gray covering the horizon. Like in a horror movie or your worst nightmare, this weird fog is nearing the vessel. It's infinite. You can't see where it starts or where it ends. Soon it makes the ship look like a grain of sand in a vast desert. That's when the realization hits. It's an iceberg, and your ship is likely going to repeat the Titanic's fate. Now, all this is a very likely scenario, since the world's biggest iceberg, A23A, is on the move again after months of spinning in a huge water vortex. And it's actually the second time in just a couple of years that this massive chunk of ice has broken free. The first time was in 2023, when the berg went wandering around after being stuck on the seafloor for a staggering 37 years. The thing is huge, about three times the size of New York City. It also weighs nearly a trillion tons. The giant chunk of ice first broke off from Antarctica's Filsner Ice Shelf back in 1986. But instead of floating away, it got grounded on the seafloor just a few miles from where it started. Because of that, it melted much more slowly than most icebergs. In December 2023, A23A finally broke free and started to drift away from Antarctica. But it didn't get far before getting stuck again, this time near the South Orkney Islands. It got trapped in something called a Taylor Column. That's a huge spinning water current that forms when ocean currents swirl around an underwater mountain. At one point, A23A was rotating around 15 degrees counterclockwise every day. Luckily, as of December 2024, the iceberg escaped the Taylor Column and is now slowly moving again. Researchers are super curious to see if it'll follow the same path as other giant icebergs that have broken off from Antarctica, or if it'll find its own unique way. Such enormous icebergs, such as A23A, release nutrients into the water as they melt. And it can actually create hot spots of life in parts of the ocean that are usually pretty empty. But there's still a lot we don't understand about how the size, shape, or origin of the iceberg might affect that process. So, to figure it out, scientists have been collecting water samples from the areas A23A is expected to pass through, and they'll keep collecting samples as it drifts along. Hopefully, it'll give us a better idea of how massive icebergs like this one influence the ocean around them. By the way, the glacier our monster of an iceberg was once part of could be very, very old, literally ancient. In Antarctica, the oldest glacier ice might be close to 1 million years old. Over in Greenland, the oldest glacier ice is more than 100,000 years old. And in Alaska, the oldest glacier ice ever recovered, found in a basin between Mount Bona and Mount Churchill, is only about 30,000 years old, a mere child. At the same time, in a typical Alaskan valley glacier, it only takes about 100 years for newly formed ice to travel through the entire length of the glacier. For something like Bering Glacier, which is Alaska's largest and stretches over 140 miles, the ice can move through the whole thing in less than 400 years. And that's a lot of movement for such a massive glacier. Now let's move on to Iceberg Alley, a stretch of the Atlantic Ocean that runs from the Arctic to Newfoundland. If you want to see as many icebergs as you can, that's the place to be. Tons of icebergs float through this place every year. Most of them come from Greenland. In spring and summer, big chunks of glaciers break off and get carried by north-south currents through Baffin Bay into the Labrador Sea, where they eventually melt. Some icebergs also come from Canada's shoreline, traveling through the Davis Strait and into the Labrador Sea before drifting along Newfoundland's eastern and western coasts. These massive ice chunks are really old too, about 10,000 years. Every year, about 400 to 800 medium and large icebergs pass through Iceberg Alley. How fast they drift depends on their size, shape, currents, waves, and wind. But the average speed is less than a half mile per hour. Now, there are six types of icebergs that make their way through Iceberg Alley. Tabular icebergs are flat slabs of ice, much wider than they are tall. Blocky icebergs have steep sides and sharp angles, like cut-off pyramids. Wedged icebergs have one steep side and one sloping side. Dome icebergs have a rounded top. Pinnacle icebergs have one or more steep peaks sticking up. And dry dock icebergs are U-shaped with a hollowed out section. They all look incredible. Comment below which is your favorite type.
Anyway, as these icebergs drift south, the warmer water speeds up their melting, making them pretty unpredictable and sometimes dangerous. Nowadays, satellites help track medium and large icebergs to prevent accidents, but smaller icebergs can still be risky for small boats. One iceberg made headlines in 2018 when it got unusually close to the Newfoundland village of Fairyland. Pictures of the giant iceberg towering over the village's houses went viral. It got stuck in a 330-foot deep water, which turned out to be too shallow for its massive size. And now, I'll take you on an unusual journey to the past to witness the birth of something beautiful and equally disastrous. Its very existence led to one of the greatest tragedies in history. Watch, an enormous chunk of ice is breaking off a glacier in southwest Greenland. It's made of snow that fell over 100,000 years ago, when mammoths were still wandering around the planet. The enormous iceberg starts its long journey. It stretches more than 1,700 feet in length and weighs 75 million tons. Despite its size, it's pretty peaceful and stays far away from ships and the busy transport routes near where it was born. But then, it starts floating south, much farther than most icebergs ever get. Usually, icebergs like this melt way before they reach such warm waters. Out of the 15,000 to 30,000 icebergs that drift away from Greenland's glaciers every year, only about 1% make it all the way to the Atlantic. So the fact that this iceberg keeps going and reaches over 5,000 miles south of the Arctic Circle by April makes it truly unique. Even after months of melting, this block of ice is still incredibly massive. It weighs around 1.5 million tons, which is almost twice as much as the Golden Gate Bridge. Above the water, its visible parts tower more than 100 feet high. But like most icebergs, the majority of it, about 90%, is hidden below the surface. The iceberg's story takes a tragic turn on April 14, 1912, when guess what? Yep, it comes across the ocean liner Titanic. The ship is about 370 miles from Newfoundland in the North Atlantic Ocean when the iceberg seems to appear out of nowhere. The crew doesn't spot it until just minutes before the crash. Why don't they see it sooner? That's a good question. Now, most people imagine icebergs as tall, bright, white chunks of ice, maybe even covered with snow. But in reality, icebergs come in all sorts of colors. Some are striped, patterned, or even have candy-like swirls. And they can also be black. There are two ways an iceberg can turn black. When the ice is extremely pure, with no bubbles or cracks, then it absorbs all the light instead of reflecting it, making it look black. Or a volcanic eruption can cover a glacier in ash. If ice from that glacier breaks off, it can have a dark or black color. Now, Scientists still aren't sure why the Titanic's iceberg looked dark, or even if it really did. But one sailor who was on the lookout in the crow's nest said it seemed black. Another described it as gray or dark gray. One theory is this iceberg could have been a blackbird, which forms when the top part melts, causing the iceberg to roll over. If the bottom is smooth enough to absorb light, it looks dark. But even if the iceberg wasn't truly black, nighttime could have made it much harder to spot. Icebergs don't reflect much light, especially if they're jagged or vertical. They end up blending into the dark, shimmering ocean. Without radar, icebergs at night are incredibly hard to see, which is probably why the Titanic's crew didn't notice it in time. The largest volcanic region on Earth is not in Africa or Japan, but under the ice of Antarctica. Scientists found 138 volcanoes in its western part, and if they decide to go wild, you'll surely notice it. They could melt huge amounts of ice that will move into the ocean, raise its level, and make our planet uninhabitable for humans. But before you pack your things to fly away to another planet, hear me out. Only two of the Antarctic volcanoes are officially classified as active now. And it would take a whole series of eruptions, decade after decade, to seriously impact the whole world. Mount Erebus, one of the two Antarctic volcanoes currently in action, proudly bears the title of the world's southernmost active one. It has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It emits plumes of gas and steam and sometimes even spews out rocks. 
and scientists call it Strombolian eruptions. One of the coolest features is a lava lake in one of its summit craters, with molten material on the surface. Such lakes are rather rare, because they need certain conditions to make sure the surface never freezes over. The second active volcano is Deception Island, a horseshoe-shaped landmass. It is the caldera of an active volcano that last erupted over 50 years ago. Scientists who monitor it say it shouldn't go wild anytime soon. Antarctica also has plenty of fumaroles. Those are volcanic vents that release gases and vapors into the air. In the right conditions, they can spew out enough stuff to build fumarolic ice towers up to 10 feet tall. Scientists keep an eye on the Antarctic volcanoes with seismometers that detect when the Earth starts trembling from volcanic activity. Sometimes they also use more complicated tech, but it's all really challenging because of how far away this polar region is and how tricky it is to get there. That's why no one can predict when one of the continent's volcanoes that are now sleeping might erupt. We can guess what this waking up would look like if we analyze the events from nearly 20,000 years ago. So, shall we? One of Antarctica's sleeping volcanoes, Mount Takahe, had a series of eruptions and spewed out a good amount of halogens rich in ozone back then. Some scientists say these events warmed up the southern hemisphere. Glaciers started to melt and helped finish the last ice age. For these events to repeat, we'd need a series of eruptions with substances rich in halogens from one or more volcanoes that are now above the ice. It's an unlikely scenario, but since it already happened in the past, it's not completely impossible. As for volcanoes hiding under a thick layer of ice, it looks like their gases would hardly make it to the atmosphere. But they would be strong enough to melt huge caverns in the base of the ice and produce a serious amount of meltwater. The West Antarctic ice sheet is wet and not frozen to its bed, so this meltwater would work as a lubricant and set the overlying ice into motion soon. The volume of water that even a large volcano would generate in this way is nothing compared to the volume of ice beneath it. So a single eruption wouldn't make a difference. But several volcanoes erupting close to or beneath any of the western Antarctica's big ice streams would. Those ice streams are rivers of ice that take most of the frozen water in Antarctica into the ocean. If they change their speed and bring unusual amounts of water into the ocean, its level will rise. As the ice would get thinner and thinner, there would be more and more new eruptions. Scientists call it a runaway effect. Something like that happened in Iceland. The number of volcanic eruptions went up when glaciers started to recede at the end of the last ice age. So it looks like, for massive changes, several powerful volcanoes above the ice with gases full of halogens need to get active within a few decades of each other and stay strong over many tens to hundreds of years. Antarctica stores around 80% of all the fresh water in the world, and if they melted all of it, global sea levels would rise by almost 200 feet. And then we'd have to look for a new planet to live on. But this again is an unlikely scenario. It's more likely that the eruptions under the ice will lubricate ice streams and seep water into the ocean. But it wouldn't be the end of the world. A super strong, super angry supervolcano could do it, though. And it has already happened in the past. Over 200 million years ago, the world went through a major makeover with not one, not two, but four massive volcanic eruptions and huge pulses. The supervolcano called Camp had been erupting over and over for 600,000 years. It all happened in Rangelia, a large chunk of land that used to be a supermassive volcano stretching across what's now British Columbia and Alaska. And it wasn't the lava or the volcanic ash that ruined the environment. The eruption made carbon levels skyrocket. The planet would never be the same again. This volcanic activity might have helped dinosaurs grow from cat-sized critters into giants we saw in Jurassic Park. It kicked off a 2 million year rainy season. It made the whole world hot and humid. And the dinos just loved it. Researchers dug deep into sediment layers beneath an ancient lake in Asia to uncover these secrets. They found traces of volcanic ash and mercury, clear signs of those epic eruptions. There were carbon signatures showing huge spikes in carbon dioxide levels. It made the atmosphere toasty, and the rain poured down. 
So the bad news is, another eruption like this could happen. The supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park has been sleeping for nearly 70,000 years. But if it wakes up, it would be many times more catastrophic than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It's considered the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history. It followed two months of earthquakes and injection of magma below the volcano that weakened and destroyed the entire north face of the mountain. The eruption column went 80,000 feet into the atmosphere and spread ash over 11 U.S. states and several Canadian provinces. The last Yellowstone eruption was a thousand times greater than that. The ground above Yellowstone sits on a hot spot made of molten and semi-molten rock called magma. This magma stuff flows into a chamber beneath the park, about four to six miles down, making the ground puff up like a balloon. But then, as it cools down, the ground goes back to its usual state. Volcano watchers have been keeping an eye on this for a century. They noticed the ground lift up about 10 inches around 20 years ago, but since 2010, it's been going back down. The experts say we have no big eruptions on the horizon, so doomsday isn't coming anytime soon. But there's some underground activity going on lately which keeps us interested. Since humans haven't been around to witness every little thing Yellowstone does, it's kind of tough to say for sure what's brewing down there. Yellowstone has had some epic eruptions within the last couple million years. They happen like clockwork, with gaps of six to 800,000 years between them. The last big one was around 640,000 years ago, and it basically reshaped the entire landscape, spreading ash and debris as far as Louisiana. You can still see the aftermath of the last big eruption in the Yellowstone caldera today. Experts say a massive eruption like the last one is an unlikely scenario. We're more likely to see eruptions of steam and hot water or lava flows. When and with what force it will wake up remains a mystery to scientists. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.